Thanks very much for that very kind introduction, Susan. Um, it's my great pleasure this evening to uh, introduce the Jack Kelly Award. I'll say a few words about the, the award in a moment, and then I'll I'll announce the uh, the winner of the Jack Kelly Award for 2021. And uh, and then I'll it'll be my great pleasure to uh, to moderate a Q and A uh, on on a presentation by the the, the award winner following that. Uh, and we have a video presentation. So by way of background, the Jack Kelly Award was created in honour of Professor Jack Kelly, who was head of physics at the University of New South Wales between 1985 and 1989. He was made an honorary professor of the University of Sydney in 2004 and was president of the Royal Society of New South Wales in 2005 and 2006. The purpose of the Jack Kelly Award is to encourage excellence in postgraduate research in physics, the award supported by the Royal Society of New South Wales and the Australian Institute of Physics, New South Wales branch. And the winner is selected from a short list of candidates who've made presentations at the most recent Australian Institute of Physics, New South Wales po branch postgraduate awards. It's my great pleasure to, uh, to announce that the Jack Kelly Award for 2021 has been awarded to Zane Medi, a PhD candidate in the Department of Quantum Science and Technology at the Australian National University. Zane investigates quantum physics in the mesoscopic regime, the intermediate scale between the microscopic world of individual atoms and the macroscopic world of classical objects. Their work focuses on theoretical investigations of exotic phenomena, such as superfluidity and turbulence in cold atom systems, and has led to four publications in high impact journals. Hi everyone, my name is Dan. I am a PhD researcher at the Department of Quantum Science and Technology at ANU. And today I'll be telling you about some of my research that I'm doing in the field of quantum physics. So specifically, I will be talking about the so-called mesoscopic world, which is the scale of the universe bigger than individual atoms and smaller than things like cheese. So you've probably heard the technology macroscopic, the terminology macroscopic before. Again, this refers to things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, when you're driving to work, when you're throwing a tennis ball, when you're eating something like cheese. These are all things in the macroscopic world that we have a good intuitive and scientific understanding of. This should be compared with the microscopic world of individual atoms, which over the last hundred years, the development of quantum physics has revealed to us behaves very differently to the macroscopic world. We have a different set of laws this, describing how an individual atom or an electron behave, and we call these laws quantum physics. But while we have a pretty good understanding of the microscopic world, sorry, we are currently lacking a strong understanding of the intermediate regime, which we call the mesoscopic world. And this might be the regime where we have hundreds or thousands or even millions of atoms that do not behave quite like a single atom do, but also have some quantum properties that distinguish them from macroscopic objects like tennis balls and cheats. So first let's talk about what is quantum. Now, quantum physics, as I said, is the physics of everything at the microscopic scale. And what it tells us is that atoms, electrons, and all particles have wave-like properties in addition to particle-like properties. What I mean by this is in contrast to the traditional picture of the atom that you might've seen in schools, where you have a point-like nucleus with point-like electrons opening it, the atom is actually a wave that's distributed across all of space. So an atom might not be precisely here or here because it's a wave that's distributed across a range of different points in space. Now, that doesn't seem too crazy until we think about the other possibilities that we can have if atoms are indeed described as waves. What if we have the atom being a wave something like this, where we have a bump over here and then a bump on the right? What this would mean is that an atom can be a little bit over here on the left 
a little bit over here on the right and not at all in the middle. So the atom described by this wave is in two places at once, which is a bizarre phenomenon that we can't have if an atom is just like a particle or, or something like this that we learned at school. And it turns out that there are a lot of other bizarre, unintuitive predictions of quantum mechanics that arise because atoms behave as waves that give rise to a lot of really interesting fundamental physics in the microscopic world that is not at all present in the macroscopic world we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, before I get onto my research, why do we care about quantum in the first place? So depending on who you are and what your interests are, I could pitch it three different ways. The first is that a lot of our modern technology already runs on quantum physics. The chips in your phone, the computer chips in your phone, in your computer, in your TV, they all re rely on semiconductor technology, which at a fundamental level runs on quantum physics. If you look at the equations that describe these semiconductors, they're all derived from, from quantum, quantum physics. Now, the second kind of pitch I might give, and especially if I'm trying to get some money for you from you to fund my research, I might pitch that understanding quantum physics is essential to the kind of new revolutionary technologies that are emerging these days that not only rely on a description of quantum physics, but use quantum physics in such a way to do things that we cannot do with any other technology. And the kind of best sales pitch for this is Google's Sycamore quantum processor, which has recently um, they published some work showing that they were able to do a calculation with this quantum computer that you can't do or you feasibly can't do with even the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Now, the third and final pitch is actually the one that is most convincing to me and probably a lot of physicists uh, that you might talk to, which is that regardless of technological application, quantum physics is the fundamental law of everything in the universe. So if we want to uncover any sort of fundamental truth, what is the universe? How does everything in the universe, universe behave? We have to turn to quantum physics. Now, again, going back to the kind of technological motivation, we're not gonna build any quantum technologies out of a single atom. What we're actually looking for is to study quantum effects in, in lots of atoms, maybe thousands or ten thousands or millions of atoms, again in this mesoscopic scale. One of the ways in which we can study this is a very exciting state of matter called Bose-Einstein condensation. And basically what happens in Bose-Einstein condensation is the wave-like properties of atoms all collectively combine, so all of the waves constructively add up with each other, to create a superatom that might look something like this. And that superatom has quantum features at much larger scales than a single atom and has a lot of extra features that a single atom doesn't have. And so these are really interesting places to study quantum effects on scales that might have a technological application and on scales that we don't understand properly. The trick to, to making Bose-Einstein condensation happen to seeing these superatoms is to cool atoms down to as cold as physically possible. So as cold uh, as we can physically make anything in the universe. So this graph kind of gives you three different regimes. If you have a gas of uh, atoms at room temperature, say just the atoms in the air, they don't have any discernible wave-like properties. They're just particles that are kind of zipping around in, in random directions. But as you cool the atoms down, the wave-like properties become more apparent. If you cool them down to, to like minus 10, minus 20 degrees Celsius, you still actually don't see this, this superatom phenomenon coming out. You actually have to cool it to a, a billionth uh, of a degree above absolute zero, which is the coldest kind of temperatures that we have anywhere in the universe. So the way this works in practice is we take a, a cloud of pretty cold atoms. Maybe we've taken the atoms and we've cooled them with liquid nitrogen or we've put them in a freezer for a long time. 
we put them into some sort of complicated machine and that machine is going to cool our atoms down and spit out a, a Bose-Einstein condensate superatom over here that we might be able to investigate in an experiment. But as you can imagine, sorry, the details of what goes on in this complicated machine is really important. And it's really actually quite hard to cool down to these super low temperatures. Now, there's a variety of techniques that go into the cooling, but in almost every experiment that has ever made a Bose-Einstein condensate, they use one particular technique at the end of the cooling called evaporative cooling. Now, evaporative cooling is actually a technique that we all might be familiar with. It's, it's used in air conditioning, but we also use it whenever we have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee that's a bit too hot to drink. And what happens is we'll blow on the top of the cup of tea and after a second or, or two, it'll cool down a little bit. Uh, maybe we'll blow on it again, it'll cool down a little bit more and we'll be able to drink it. So what's actually happening here is when we blow on the tea or we blow on the coffee or whatever hot beverage you, you prefer, we're getting rid of the high energy hot atoms that are sitting at the very top of your tea. And so we're getting rid of some of the energy from the tea. The rest of the energy in the atoms that are still in the tea redistribute and equilibrate at a slightly lower temperature. And so by doing this a couple of times, by getting rid of some of the hottest atoms, we can reduce the overall energy of the tea, making it nice and delicious to drink. Now, the problem with this process when we try and apply it to Bose-Einstein condensation is to get to these super low temperatures, we have to blow away so many of the atoms that we lose about 99.9% .9 of the atoms in order to get to these super low temperatures. And so this puts a limit on how big we can make our final super atom Bose-Einstein condensate because even if we're loading up maybe 10 times or 20 times more atoms at the very beginning, we're losing most of those atoms by the time we get to the, the um, super atom in which we can study the quantum effects. So we need some kind of new technique to allow us to create even bigger super atom Bose Einstein condensates. So we might be able to explore quantum effects at increasingly large scales. This is something that my group at ANU has been working on. And we've come up with a technique called feedback cooling, which relies on the concept that temperature is this random motion of your atoms. So if you have higher temperature, your atoms are moving faster. If you have lower temperature, your atoms are moving slower, all in random directions. The idea about this technique is we have a feedback loop. So at the beginning of the loop, what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the atoms, as in we're gonna look at how our atoms are moving. We're gonna take that information about how the atoms are moving. We're gonna apply some kind of force that's gonna cancel out that motion. So you can kind of think of this as, we're gonna apply some sort of force that's gonna act like friction on the atoms, causing them to lose some of the velocity and slow down. This extracts energy from the system. And so the remaining energy in the system is going to redistribute, equilibrating at a slightly lower temperature. And then we're going to measure it again, apply the force again, and we're going to keep doing this until the, all of the hot energy is extracted from the system and the atoms come to a lower temperature. The benefit of this is that at no point in this process have we thrown away our atoms like we do in evaporative cooling. All of the energy is extracted by applying this friction force rather than getting rid of the hottest atoms. Now, while this seems like a fairly simple conceptual proposal, the actual proposal on how do you do this in experiment is quite hard and it relies on complicated laser technology. Now, this is the kind of plot that um, we will put in one of our upcoming works. So I'm not gonna go through it in too much detail, but the key, this illustrates all the key concepts we talked about. The white gray cloud is our atoms and they're held in place by this red laser here. So that basically stops the atoms from falling due to gravity or, or leaving our experiment um, sideways. And we're gonna continuously shine a laser on the atoms that allows us to measure the position of the atoms and therefore the motion of the atoms. And all of this information is fed into this computer chip here. 
in which we process that information and turn it into some sort of force, which is applied to the atoms through this green laser here. So by continuously applying all of these lasers to the atoms, we can realize this feedback control loop. So is this gonna work? Well, that depends. And it depends on two key trade-offs. The first is that atoms at the quantum scale are very sensitive to, to light or any sort of perturbation. So if the laser that we shine on the atoms is too strong, that's going to destroy our atomic cloud and we're not gonna be able to create the super uh, atom birds Einstein condensate at the end. But the stronger we measure, the stronger the light is, the more information we get. So we have this trade-off between destruction of the cloud and information in each measurement. The second trade-off that we have is that if there are too many atoms, if the cloud is too dense, then we won't be able to see the fine details of that atomic motion. The, the reason for this is not very obvious, but it's due to something called the diffraction limit. And it's about the wavelength of the light becoming uh, much longer than the motion, than the scale of the motion of the atoms. And so the light can't pick up that information as it's crossing through the atomic cloud. And so these are two things that we have to carefully optimize and control when we do the experiment. But is it gonna work? Yeah, my good friend, Matt Go, who used to work in our group at ANU, but is now a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford, did a lot of really intense numeric simulations for a very specific case study showing that a small number of atoms can be cooled using this technique. Now, these simulations were actually really hard and used millions of supercomputer hours. And so we weren't able to scale this to the kind of bigger atomic clouds that we might want to investigate in an experiment. But simple arguments uh, have allowed us to estimate that it will work for, for much larger atomic clouds, and it will in fact work better the larger your atomic cloud is up to a certain extent. And so in order to, to actually see how powerful this technique will be, how versatile it will be, someone needs to do the experiment. Someone needs to realize this feedback loop and, and show whether how well it works and, and what are the limitations. And again, my good friend, Yostri, who currently works with me, at the ANU is working on experiments just like this that are gonna develop the techniques that we need in order to realize this in experiment in the next couple of years. So that's about it for feedback cooling um, and that particular aspect of my research, but there's a lot of other stuff that I'm interested in. Ultimately, my research is anything you can study with these super atom Bose-Einstein condensates which range from these technological applications, um, quantum computing, sensing really small forces using uh, the nature of quantum physics to enhance our precision, all the way to fundamental studies of things like turbulence, which we can look at in these systems and we can, we can understand at a really fundamental level. But with that, I will thank you all for listening and I will open it up to questions. Zane for that uh, that wonderful presentation. Uh, I've got a, an opening question uh, that's been posted in the chat, and which is which is the if you could maybe elaborate is is the, the the question I don't fully understand it, but let me put it out there, and you can make of it what you will. Zane um, mm -hmm. is the mesoscopic scale is it is it a probabilistic scale that you're the model that you're working with for your feedback control no it's more like it it's it's kind of just a fancy word uh i use when i'm telling other people about my, my research but it doesn't actually come in in the specific model we're using the the models we use is actually the microscopic model that describes a single atom or, or an electron we're just applying it to these large systems where we have you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or a million atoms. So I guess specifically what we mean when, uh, or what I mean when I say mesoscopic is we're talking about a lot of atoms, like a million atoms, which is a lot of atoms compared to one atom, 
but uh, very little atoms compared to the number of atoms in my face, for example. Okay, I, I have a, a follow-on question, and it, it might be, you, I'll give it to you, you can make, you, you can do what you like with it. Is it possible without equations and just by moving your hands around to give a sense of what the, what the model is that you're trying to apply a feedback control to? So I'm not sure I can do it without equations. It's fairly, the, the, the simplest example is um, basically what we have is we have a whole bunch of atoms, like a cloud of atoms that are uh, confined. So it's kind of like, you know, you can imagine you have a, a ball or some kind of football shape of atoms. And the, when the, um, this is at a really cold temperature, i.e. I, the temperatures we want to study, it's not moving very much, right? It's not fluctuating in its size and it doesn't have, it's not kind of wiggling around. It's, it's staying a very nice, clear shape that we can then study. But what happens when it ha it's at some kind of uh, higher temperature than we want is it's kind of fluctuating around and all the atoms are shaking around. And so you have some complicated motion. The simplest kind of motion we can think of is just, let's imagine if the atomic cloud was just moving from side to side. And so this is just kind of, if you have a bowl, you might have a marble and it's just rocking back and forth. And so one way we might apply a kind of feedback control to cool this oscillating um, marble or oscillating cloud down is just to move the bowl. So if I have a marble moving in a bowl, I wish I had one with me. But if I had a marble moving in a bowl, I could move the bowl in such a way that it's going to cancel out the motion and the, the marble is eventually going to stop oscillating and it's going to settle down the bottom. And so uh, what we're doing is we're trying to design a control, some sort of way of controlling the clouds that it not only gets rid of this motion, gets rid of this motion and the motion where these atoms are going this way and these atoms are going this way and all different, you know, other possibilities of how the different atoms are moving. Actually, that, that's, that's, uh, that really helps me. Follow one question then. Uh, the benefits of feedback control always come at the risk of instability. Is instability a major issue for you here and or is uh, is the the noise that you observe is 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 that likely to be a limiting factor on on the on the reliability of the control that you can exert? Definitely. So I kind of touched on this uh, at a at a very high level in the talk when I talked about this problem where um, when we we measure too hard we destroy the cloud. Mm. So if our if our laser is too hard, then all of our atoms get uh, really high energy from the laser and then just leave our experiment. And so what we want is we use actually quite weak lasers that interact quite weakly with the atoms. But what happens if the, the laser is too weak is that our signal, uh, the information that we measure is very noisy. And so there is a limit where if we make our lasers sufficiently weak, then most of the, um, the measurement result that we're getting it's more, it's more noise than information. So it's basically just garbage. And then the, when we try and use that garbage information to apply some kind of friction force, we might get an anti-friction force, which rather than taking energy away, it adds energy to the system. And so we have this kind of relatively complicated trade-off um, that we, we study by doing a whole bunch of simulations for a whole bunch of different uh, laser strengths, essentially. Um, and, and kind of trying to find where, where the optimum trade-off between not destroying our cloud, but also not having, um, or having a stable control loop. Mm. That, that, that's a very interesting answer. It leads very nicely onto a question we've had posted in the Q&A from David Nash, who, who um, asks, when the laser friction reduces the thermal motion and reduces the temperature of the gas, where's the energy difference gone? It's gone into the, the laser. Um, so so the, in, in that diagram in my slides, we had three different lasers, one to confine it, one to measure it, one to apply the force. 
um, that force goes into, uh, sorry, when we apply that force to extract the energy, that energy is going in into um, that light essentially that, uh, that of the laser that's actually applying the force. So energy is uh, being removed from the atoms, but it's going into our laser and ultimately, you know, the coils of our experiment and stuff. But those are things that are at such high energy that the, the little bit of energy that we extract from the atoms doesn't really make a difference. But that's a good question. And it really got me confused when I was uh, starting with this project. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sain. We don't have any more questions. I'll, I'll, with that, I'll hand over to uh, Kathy Belov, P Professor Kathy Belov, uh, AOFRSN. So much, Stephen, um, and thanks, Zane, for that fascinating talk. Um, so today I have the pleasure of introducing um, our Royal Society of New South Wales scholarship winners. So these scholarships acknowledge outstanding achievement by young researchers. So as Susan mentioned at the start of the hour, in addition to their prize money, they also get a complimentary year of associate membership of the society. And we look forward to um, interacting with these um, young researchers throughout, throughout the year and hopefully they remain and continue to engage with the society. So what I'm gonna do now is introduce all three speakers, all three winners, um, and then we'll play three videos and then open up for Q&A. So I'll encourage you to pop your questions in Q&A so you don't forget them, pop them in as we go and I'll come back to those questions at the end. Um, but today our first speaker is going to be Sajad Abulpur Mushizi, who is a PhD candidate at Macquarie University, which is my alma mater. In his PhD, Sajad is conducting research on the development of hair cell sensors for use in the semiconductor canals in the inner ear to treat patients suffering from balance problems and gaze instability. Um, he's the recipient of the Biomolecular Discovery Research Centre Postgraduate Prize and winner of the best internationally peer-reviewed paper by a postgraduate student as a first author for a publication in Nanomicro Letters. It's amazing that Shahad already has more than 30 peer-reviewed journal articles. Our second speaker is Harry Marcus. Harry is a PhD candidate in the School of Physics at the University of Sydney, which is where I'm currently based. So it's nice that there are these associations. His research is primarily conducted at the Department of Nuclear Medicine at the Royal North Shore Hospital under the supervision of Professor Dale, Dale Bailey. His project is titled Development of a Dosimetry Platform for Theranos theranostic agents. And Harry is also, has also collected a lot of uh, accolades. His research has already gained international recognition, receiving the Arthur Weiss Award in 2020 for outstanding original work in radiation safety and dosimetry from the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. And his work was featured at the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging Plenary Lecture Highlights, Basic Science Instrumentation and Data Analysis Image Generation Session, and was also shortlisted for the best poster award in the physics track. So tremendous talent there. And our third award winner is Kevin Chow, who's a Masters of Research student at Macquarie University. Um, Kevin joined the analytical um, glycoimmunology team in April 2018 as an undergraduate volunteer to study the removal of synapses by microglial receptors in the brain during sleep. And after completing his coursework, he decided to take a Master of Research degree focusing on platelet glycobiology. Kevin has also picked up a stack of awards, including the Lefebvre Memorial Prize and an Amgen Scholarship. And his research focuses on mapping of the glycoproteome of human platelets. So we're gonna watch the three videos now and don't forget to pop your questions into the Q&A.
Good evening, everybody. My name is Sajid Abu Mushizi. I'm a PhD candidate at the uh, School of Engineering at Macro University under supervision of Associate Professor Mohsen Asadnia. I'm so proud and excited to be one of recipients of Royal Society of New South Wales Scholarships. And I'm looking forward to presenting some of my PhD research findings to you. My PhD research aims to develop a biomimetic vestibular system to restore balance of body. Since vestibular disorders afflict one in three people throughout their lives, my project seeks to help old people to decrease the consequences of vestibular dysfunction, including chronic impairment of balance, posture, and gaze stability. The peripheral vestibular system is comprised of five sensory organs, three semicircular canals, and two otolytic organs, the utricle and sacule. Together, this system is responsible for sensing head and body position within the environment, maintaining balance, perceiving direction and movement, and controlling eye movements when the body is in the motion. Generally, the head can rotate around three rotation axes, namely roll, pitch, and yaw. As I said, vestibular system is comprised of three semicircular canals in each air, and each canal is oriented in a different plane and maximally sensitive to the rotations perpendicular to the canal plane. Each semicircular canal has a bulge region named ampulla, inside which there is a standing structure named cupola, a gelatinous structure that covered all cross section of the canal. The cupola encompasses many sensory hair cells to transmit the head movement signals to the brain. So we can consider that the sensory part of the semicircular canals is sending a structure that is responsible for transmitting signals to the brain. Unfortunately, there is currently no re reliable treatments for patients with this chronic vestibular dysfunction. A promising therapy is electrical stimulation of this vestibular system by bypass the dysfunctional sensory receptors. Like the success of the cochlear implants in hearing patients with balance disorders implanted with vestibular implants, recognize improvements in posture, gait, eye stability, and quality of their life. However, there are some challenges with the implanted vestibular prosthesis. One of the most important challenge, challenges is the high risk of auditory dysfunction and vestibular structure damage after surgery. The other problem is current spread. That is because electrical current is hard to localize, localize in a specific vestibular neurons and that would result in a stimulating other neurons. The observed disconjugate eye movements in one of the consequences of this problem. By compatibility, functionality, and longevity of the implanted device are critical factors for implanted medical devices. Promising, pro, promising next generation of Vestibular implants is likely to be an artificial vestibular system comprised of artificial hair cell sensors embedded inside 3D printed miniaturized semicircular canals. Although the idea of this kind of vestibular implants is so innovative, the researchers are working on the fundamental of this idea by fabricating ultra sensitive hair cell sensors and 3D printing miniaturized semicircular canals. In my project, we need to have a model semicircular canal and a head movement simulator for mimicking the vestibular system. So a human head MRI image was taken to extract the semicircular canals and find dimensions of each part of canal and select lateral semicircular canal. For mimicking the head, the head movements, we developed an in-house Python code integrated with Arduino module to recognize the head moving. In the first project, we made a flow sensor made of liquid crystal polymer pattern with gold. After characterization, characterization process, the sensor was embedded into the 3D printed and canal 
and put on the rotary table to, for testing. Using nanotechnology in the second project, we fabricated an artificial hair cell sensor made of vertical graphene nanosheets with maze-like network supported by very thin and soft layer of PDMS. We characterized the sensor with applying a stationary flow over the sensor in a straight channel. We found out the sensitivity of the sensor is far higher than other flow sensor found in the literature. In, in order to deal with biocompatibility issue in the third project, we've proposed a flow sensor with the same sensing element, regions with a substrate of PVA hydrogen. Overall, in this, in this research, we fabricate three by inspired hair cell sensors and outcome of this artificial hair cell sensor published in high ranked journals. The first sensor has good sensitivity and low response time. The VGM PDMS flow sensor demonstrate ultra high sensitivity and low frequency threshold 0.5 Hertz, while the last sensor, VGN's PVA hydrogel, in addition to biocompatibility, uh, had very low frequency threshold about 0.1 Hertz that is suitable for vestibular hair cell application. As you can see on the plot showing sensor output and the stage output versus time, we can conclude three points. Phase difference between sensor and the stage outputs, two significant peaks on one cycle and increasing output with increasing frequency. The existence of two peaks on one cycle of head moving indicates the direction of the head. So the proposed sensors can detect, can detect the head moving and the direction of the head. To evaluate or uh, experimental data and have a deep understanding of flow behavior inside the canal when rotating a numerical setup, including fluid solid interface technique was, uh, was designed in Kamsul. And as you can see, this is a video uh, from the numerical simulation uh, in Kamsul. And the numerical um, results were in a good agreement with experimental data, as you can see. To sum up, um, this research paved the way for developing the next generation of vestibular implants with alter ultimate goal of restoring balance dysfunction. This kind of proposed flow sensor have, have different application like blood or urine flow monitoring, intravenous therapy, water leakage monitoring and unmanned underwater robots through incorporation of appropriate packaging of device. The research findings have been published in uh, pre uh, prestigious journals such as Nanomicro Letters, Advanced Materials Technology, and ACS Applied Materials and Interface. And uh, we, we can publish two conference papers during my uh, PhD period. At the end, I would like to appreciate any support from Asad Nia Lab, uh, Asad Nia Lab Group for conducting this research, especially from my supervisor, Associate Professor Monsen Asad Nia, and my co-supervisor, Dr. Shuing Wo. Thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is Harry Marquis, and I'm a PhD candidate at the School of Physics at the University of Sydney. My research is based at Royal North Shore Hospital um, under the supervision of Professor Dale Bailey. I would first like to say that I am honoured to receive this award. Um, I was especially uh, delighted to pass on this news to my grandmother, as her grandfather, Professor James Douglas Stewart, was president of the society in 1927. Uh, so being a recipient of this award is um, especially meaningful to me. Um, I hope you enjoy my presentation. Today I will be presenting on improved imaging for targeted radiation treatments in cancer patients. This work was born out of a research exchange visit to University College London in 2019, 
where I began working on a novel image reconstruction method aimed at improving our image-based asymmetry estimates following radionuclide therapy. Theranostics is a combination of the words therapeutic and diagnostic. Generally, the term is used to describe the use of some diagnostic tool to help define the therapeutic tool for a specific disease. In the context of nuclear medicine, theranostics is a term used to describe the combination of using one radioactive drug to identify and diagnose disease and a second radioactive drug with the same targeting ligand to deliver therapy in order to treat the disease. Commonly, this translates to the use of a positron emitting radio label to demonstrate targeting of the disease, which can be imaged with uh, positron emission tomography, or PET for short. This is followed by a therapeutic radio label that delivers a highly targeted dose of radiation to the cancer, usually in the form of short range beta minus emissions, which in turn causes lethal damage to the cancer in the form of single strand and double strand DNA breaks. Therapeutic radio labels commonly have accompanying single gamma photon emissions, uh, which can then be imaged uh, with single photon emission computed tomography, or SPECT for short. We can see this demonstrated in the figure on the bottom right. On the left is a pre-treatment gallium-68 PET scan of a patient with widespread metastatic neuroendocrine tumours. The SPECT images to the right of this show subsequent cycles of lutetium-177 therapy. The images show that the patient is responding to the therapy as evidenced by the reduction in total tumour burden and intensity in the post-cycle 4 SPECT image compared to the post-cycle 1 SPECT image. My research work has primarily focused on a promising new theranostic pair of the positron emitting radio label COPPER64 with the therapeutic beta minus and gamma emitting radio label COPPER67. Since COPPER64 emits a positron, it is suitable as a diagnostic agent and can be imaged with positron emission tomography. COPPER67 is a beta emitting radioisotope suitable for therapeutic use with gamma emissions that enable SPECT imaging. A clinical trial was conducted at the Royal North Shore Hospital for patients suffering from unresectable meningioma. This trial was conducted using Clarity Pharmaceuticals Novel Citate product, a treatment agent based on a peptide which targets somatostatin type 2 receptors, which are overexpressed in a number of neuroendocrine and meningioma tumours. The citate agent binds to these receptors, enabling PET image, imaging of the uptake in the disease when using the diagnostic radio label COPPER64. If significant uptake is demonstrated, the radio label is then switched out to COPPER67, where a high radiation dose payload can be delivered directly to the sites of disease. This was the first in-man trial of the COPPER67 citate agent for radionuclide therapy, and as such, image-based asymmetry of the COPPER67 radio label for both target volumes and organs at risk is of great interest. So here we can see the pre-treatment COPPER64 PET planning scans for workup of COPPER67 radionuclide therapy. Subjects were imaged at 1, 4 and 24 hours post-injection of 200 megabecquerels of COPPER64 citate. Compared to shorter-lived PET isotopes such as gallium-68, which are typically exclusively imaged at 1 hour post-injection, we were able to produce pretty remarkable images up to 24 hours post-injection and beyond. So this COPPER64 and COPPER67 pairing really is a game changer in terms of treatment planning for radionuclide therapy, potentially allowing for prospective dosimetry estimates so that treatment may become personalised. That is, the injected dose of the therapeutic agent may be tailored to the individual based off their pre-therapy PET imaging. Here we can see the SPECT images from cycle 1 of COPPER67 therapy. Due to COPPER67's longer half-life, we can image out to later time points, such as 96 hours, as shown here on the far right. Imaging was exclusively 3D whole body spec CT at 1, 4, 24 and 96 hours post-injection of 5 gigabecquerels of COPPER67 citate. It is evident that the resolution of our conventional spec image reconstructions is poor when compared to the PET image shown on the far left. The image projections shown here have been windowed so that the primary lesion could be seen. The lesions are much fainter in the SPECT images compared to PET, and this is primarily a consequence of the different spatial resolutions between the two modalities. So the question is, can we accurately estimate the radiation dose we deliver to volumes of interest using the image data available to us from SPECT imaging of the therapeutic isotope? Um, this question is indeed very tricky to answer. We do have some confidence that our dosimetry estimates to large volumes, such as the kidneys and liver, are not, are not significantly impacted by the poor spatial resolution of the gamma camera. 
The main concern is that the radioactivity concentration in small structures, such as metastatic and nodal disease, are severely underestimated, directly, directly leading to an underestimate in the true dose that we, that we deliver to small target lesions. Here we can see the difference between PET and SPECT spatial resolution demonstrated in clinical patient data. On the left is a PET reconstructed image of the COPPER64 diagnostic radio label, and on the right we have a conventional SPECT reconstruction of the COPPER67 therapy. We expect the apparent lesion size and radioactivity uptake for both the COPPER64 and COPPER67 sartate agents to be similar, so the drastic difference we are seeing here is primarily governed by the different spatial resolutions of the two imaging systems. So what can be done about this? Um, how can we improve the spatial resolution of our SPECT reconstructed images so that they are more PET-like? Guided image reconstruction methods have been used extensively in emission tomography such as PET and SPECT. Most commonly the imaging modality that is used to guide the reconstruction is anatomical, for example CT or MRI. The figure on the top shows an example of the so-called kernel reconstruction method, where reconstruction of PET data has been guided by the accompanying MRI image. On the left we can see a standard PET reconstruction, then the kernel reconstructed PET image, and on the right we see the MRI image that was used to guide the reconstruction. It, it is evident that the kernel method has produced a far superior PET reconstructed image, both in terms of resolution and noise. In order to improve the accuracy of our image-based dosimetry estimates, we propose a novel approach to SPECT image reconstruction, which we call SPECTA, that is single photon emission computed theranostic reconstruction. Our SPECTA approach uses the kernel method to reconstruct SPECT data, where a diagnostic PET image with its superior spatial resolution is used as the guiding modality. This work is the first example of using PET data to guide SPECT reconstructions. And here we have some PET and SPECT images from the copper sartate trial. On the left we can see a projection of the copper 64 PET image, and on the right we have axial cross sections through three of the lesions for the PET and various SPECT reconstructed images. Looking at lesion 4, SPECT sees an increase in radioactivity concentration by a factor of 3.3 compared to the conventional SPECT reconstruction on the top right. This significant increase would also be reflected in the image-based asymmetry estimate. With conventional reconstruction methods, we might think, for example, that this small lesion only received one gray of radiation absorbed dose, but the true dose may, may be closer to four gray. Here we can see some images of the same patient shown on the previous slide. On the top, we have a standard SPECT reconstruction. You can see that the image is quite blurry and the lesions aren't well defined. In the middle row, we can see an example of what we can achieve with the SPECTA reconstruction approach, and on the bottom row, we have the original COPPER64 PET image. It is apparent that the SPECTA reconstruction sees a significant improvement in spatial resolution over the standard OSCM reconstruction, and closely resembles the resolution and image quality of the PET image. This is most apparent in the projection images shown on the far right. SPECTA can produce images with spatial resolution comparable to PET, and with superior noise properties compared to conventional reconstruction methods. This improvement in spatial resolution directly leads to more accurate dose estimates to target lesions, potentially facil facilitating more personalised radionuclide therapies, where the injected dose is informed by pre-therapy diagnostic imaging and is tailored to the individual. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions. Hello everyone, my name is Kevin. I've just finished my Master of Research Candidature at Macquarie Uni. First of all, thank you the Royal Society of New South Wales for awarding me the scholarship and giving me a chance to present my work to the fellow society members. Today, I will talk about my master projects, decoding the black leg like approach home. This project is primarily supervised by Associate Professor Martin Anderson. Before going into my project, I would like to spend a few minutes explaining some background knowledge about protein and glycosylations. Imagine ourselves in the human bodies are like these M&M's chocolates. They are coated with different sugar molecules known as glycans. These glycans are usually linked to proteins on the cell membranes. This process is known as glycosylation and it has important roles in cell interactions and modulation of protein functions. N-glycosylation is the most prevalent form of protein glycosylation up to date, and there are four common N-glycan types, oligomenose, complex, hybrid, and posimenose. In order to study these glycans and protein glycosylation within cells or tissues, we often use the mass spectrometry-based glycomics and glycoprotomics techniques. 
Glycomics is a system-wide study of enzymatically released glycans from glycoproteins. It allows five structure elucidation of the glycans, such as monosaccharides, composition, glycosylic linkages. While the glycoproteomics is a system-wide study of intact glycopeptides and glycoproteins. In this technique, the glycoproteins are usually drained into smaller fragments of glycopeptides so that the identity of the protein and its glycosylation sites can be identified. With these two techniques, we can generate a glycom or glycoproteome, which is the entire complement of sugars and glycoproteins, where the free are present in more complex molecules of an organism at a specified time, location, and condition. Going back to my project, we are talking about platelets. So platelets are important components in the blood and they play central roles in the vascular and immune systems, including angiogenesis, hemostasis, and inflammation, and the recently reported COVID-19 vaccine induced thrombosis thrombocytopenia. Platelets circulate in our blood in the resting state in a round shape. Factors such as tissue injury activate platelets, make them change their shape into the star-like structures increase, to increase their surface area. These activated platelets release the intracellular granule proteins, trigger several signaling pathways to recruit more platelets and order immune cells to form aggregates. While previous studies have documented the importance of glycosylation in platelet biology, the entire complement of glycoproteins or glycoproteome in the platelets remain poorly defined. Therefore, this study aims to profile the end glycoproteome of resting and activated platelets we have a particular focus on the platelet release site, where all the signaling molecules of platelets are residing. To carry out the study, platelets were isolated from whole blood through several hours of centrifugation using a well-established protocol. They were then either left unstimulated or activated with alpha thrombin using um, submaximal or maximal concentration. The purity and activation status of isolated platelets were confirmed by flow cytometry Separation of the platelet lysate and releaseate was done by centrifugation. The supernatant at this point was known as the releaseate, while the pellet was known as the lysate. The platelet releaseate samples were then subjected to the standard end glycomics and end glycoproteomic workflow. There were 10 biological replicates for the resting platelets, six treated with low dose thrombin or 0.025 units per mil, and five treated with high dose thrombin or 0.2 units per mil. For N glycomics, the N glycans were enzymatically released from the glycoproteins using PNG ASAP, followed by cleanup and profiling using porous carbonized carbon liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry. For N glycoproteomics, the glycoproteins were trimmed into smaller fragments of glycopeptides using trypsin, followed by peptide cleanup and profiling using liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry. Overall, there are four T and glycan isomers spanning 28 glycan compositions identified. And the three most abundant glycans were highlighted in red. Most glycans are rich in salic acid and fucose, and there is a high level of branching across the structures in these N glycans. Surprisingly, a similar N glycan class distribution is observed across the resting and activated conditions of the blood and release -like samples with complex type N glycans highest in abundance, oligomenos and posimenos N glycans were detected in much lower abundance. Similar pattern but in different relative quantities were also observed in the blood serum, mature neutrophils and erythrocytes or the red blood cells. However, when looking at the individual structures level, some significant changes in N glycan structure were observed between the conditions. For example, there is a from dose dependent elevation in glycan 17A, 18A, and 18B, and a reduction in 21A. There is also a from in those dependent elevation of the total silylation level, which is the attachment of silic acid to the galactose, or the total level of the core fucosylation, which is the attachment of the fucose onto the glucnac here, followed by a reduction in the bisecting glucnacylation which is the branching of the glucnac into the middle metals here. And interestingly, the N-glycoproteomics data recapitulated findings from the N-glycomics data. 
As you can see from the top panels here, we have the m glycan type distribution, along with the elevated silylation and coffee constellation level found at the end glycomics data. The graphs from the bottom panel were generated from the m glycoprotramics data, and it shows a relatively similar pattern as seen from the top panel, where there is a high abundance of complex type n glycans and weak oligomenocytic and postmenocytic in n glycan signatures. There's also a significant elevation in silylation and core fucosylation level between the resting and the high dose thrombin platelet release rate. Taken together, this is like Soviet evidence supporting that there are mild and glycome alterations in the platelet release rate upon activation. However, the mechanism of the elevated silylation and core fucosylation levels require further investigation. Another interesting findings from this end glycoprotromics data is that there is dramatic subcellular specific distribution of end glycans in the platelets. By looking at proteins located in different locations in the platelets, such as alpha granules or lysosomes, we found that complex type end glycans are the key features in the alpha granules, for example, the thrombospondin one protein here. While postmenocytic type N glycans are found mostly in the lysosome, such as the lysosome associated membrane glycoprotein 2 or the LAM2. Interestingly, I found that the proteins on the bloodless surface is potentially decorated with oligomenocytic N glycans as well, such as the integrin proteins family here, um, beside the commonly studied complex N glycans. So that suggests that these oligomenocytic end glycans may play potential roles in platelet interactions beside the complex end glycans. Although there are many glycoproteins increase in level upon thrombin activations, relatively subtle end glycom remodeling accompanies this platelet activation. This was confirmed through the assigned specific end glycan profiling of thrombospondin one, an abundant alpha granule protein which is strongly elevated upon um, platelet activation. In activated platelets, secretion of thrombospondin 1 from the alpha granules generates a positive feedback loop that increases the platelet aggregations and adhesion. To allow for a visual inspection of the four and glycosylation site from responding 1, a homology model of the three dimensional protein structure of thrombospondin 1 was generated using the new alpha 4 protein structure tool. So we found that there are only sub to size specific glycosylation changes in this protein, despite a significant elevation upon from an activation. In conclusion, here's a summary figures of findings from my project. So upon from an activation, platelet changed the shape and released the intracellular components known as the release aid. This was confirmed by the increased levels of released proteins such as the from responding one from the alpha granule. And glycol mapping of resting and activated release site shows a high abundance of silylated and core fucosylated end glycans across both conditions. There are mild end glycol alterations in the platelet release site upon activation, especially in the silylation and core fucosylation level. However, the mechanisms for the elevated silylation and core fucosylation levels require further investigation. When looking at the proteins located in different locations across the platelet cells, there's dramatic subcellular specific distribution of N glycans in the platelets. So this is the first unbiased high definition map of the platelet N glycoprotein with a particular focus on the release state. These results form a useful resource for studying platelet glycobiology and diseases involving platelets such as the COVID-19 vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. In the future, I hope to expand this work by mapping the N and O glycosylation of platelet lysates with subcellular resolution and exploring how the platelet glycoprotein varies with disease. Finally, I want to express my thanks to my supervisor, Associate Professor Morton Anderson, for the greatest support ever throughout my candidature. I also want to thank the members and colleagues in the analytical glycoimmunology group and glycofmq for the support as well. I also want to thank Dr. D.M. Vanderwall, Dr. Frida Passon, and Dr. Mark Lawrence for the collaborations throughout the years, and Macquarie Uni for providing me the scholarship throughout my MRES candidate job. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take on any questions available.
Thank you to all three of our speakers. Um, I think we will all agree that the future of science is in great hands with three promising young researchers like Sajad, um, Harry and Kevin. So if we can get um, Sajad, Harry and Kevin onto the screen, we will start some our Q and A's. If you've got questions, don't forget to pop them into the Q and A chat. Um, so first off, Harry, I was absolutely fascinated to hear that your grandmother is the granddaughter of the famous JD Stewart. Um, so as well as being president of our society, he was also the pioneer of veterinary education in Australia. And of course, at Sydney Uni, we have the wonderful JD Stewart building, um, which I've spent a lot of hours in and has the most beautiful lecture theatre. So how influential was the legacy of JD Stewart in your sort of upbringing? And, you know, did it influence you to get into science or was there something else that drove you to look at developing a career in science? Um, actually, I only found out about the connection um, that my great great grandfather was JD Stewart and the JD Stewart building um, when I went to do my master's at Sydney Uni. Wow. So actually, I, I didn't know much about it before that. But in terms of science, um, my father's a professor at UNSW and my mother studied mathematics um, at Sydney Uni. Uh, so I've always been interested in science. Um, but I guess as you get older, um, you start sort of looking at, you know, your lineage and and their parents and grandparents and stuff like that. And so that's where I sort of discovered the connection. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I mean, it's clearly in your genes. <laughs> but <Thank> you. <laughs> um, what about the imaging work? How did you get into your imaging project? Because that's quite a specific field. Was it... Mm -hmm. um, Anything that, you know, you came across in your undergraduate studies or what got you to follow that path? Well, so it's funny, in my undergraduate studies um, at UTS, where I studied physics, um, my least favourite subject was um, digital image processing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'll never do this, so I don't <laughs> need to um, try, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And then I started my master's course in medical physics um, at Sydney Uni. And I really gravitated towards the imaging stuff, but I especially gravitated towards the people who taught uh, nuclear medicine. So um, Dale Bailey um, and Dr. Kathy Willowson. So they're both um, physicists at Royal North Shore Hospital. And so, yeah, I mean, they were my favourite lecturers teaching um, the content that I was most interested in and um, I think sort of pretty soon into my master's, um, I decided that if I was to continue on in research or um, a clinical career in physics, um, it would be in nuclear medicine. Um, so really it was more, um, my interest was sort of determined by who I enjoyed being taught by the most and also the content. Yeah, that's a great shout out for our fantastic teachers and role models out there. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. So, so Jad, can I ask you the same question? What inspired you to start working in the field that you're working in? Was there anything pivotal early in your career that made you follow this path? Yeah, um, actually, to be honest, um, I always mimic my, bro my older brother during my life. Uh, my, my brother uh, was a successful mechanical engineer. So I followed him uh, and um, I studied mechanical engineering, majoring fluid dynamics like my brother. And, I, um, and uh, in terms of my PhD research, um, this topic was defined by my supervisor. So I, um, so I had to study the anatomy of the inner ear and the vestibular system and know what types of diseases are related to this complicated organ and body. Um, actually, I figured out that more than 33% of adult people afflict with balanced 
disorders. And unfortunately, there is uh, currently no reliable treatments for patients with this chronic condition. So um, our group tried to mimic the vestibular system in order to deeply understand the functionality of this organ. Uh, our goal is to find a permanent remedy, uh, remedy for, this pa- for these patients, actually. That's great. I'll yeah. come back to um, the vestibular disease in a moment, but I'd also like to take a moment to ask Kevin, how did you um, find your area of interest and, you know, what path did you follow? Um, yeah, to be honest, um, back then in Vietnam, I used to be a medical student and um, I was always like amazed by how the immune system in our human body works, especially on the little cells like white blood cells and platelets works and to fight against our, um, the, the disease and pathologies. So, um, but then I realized that like, I didn't really enjoy the medical pathway really much. So I decided to come over here and start over again to do a research career instead. So, um, and then during undergrad, um, I got exposed. Um, I met my supervisor, Morton, who exposed me to the world of glycobiology. And he was also an expert in immunology as well. So it's combined together and it's really fascinating about like how cells talk to each other just via sugar molecules in the systems. And that's really, really amazing. me. So that's why I'm kind of like now, that's here I am doing research in like glycobiology and also in immunology as well. That's fantastic. And like you, I'm fascinated by the immune system and also study the immune system. Um, I think one of the the great things about your project is, you know, you ended up doing the glycoproteomics project at Macquarie University. And of course, the whole field of proteomics was established at Macquarie University. And I was a student there at the time when Mark Wilkins, as a PhD student, coined the term proteomics. And he was in the lab next door to mine. And it was just such an exciting place where that whole field was developing. So it's really great to see how the field has progressed in those, I guess it's 20 years now. And I guess I'm interested in where you see this field going. Glycoproteomics is quite new for me. I I wasn't very aware of it. Is that the new cutting edge? And if it is, what do you think the next big discoveries are in glycoproteomics? Well, it's definitely a cutting edge. And basically, um, in a lot, so I think um, for proteomics, it has been like to a saturation phase now, like where like everything, like there was software for development, like you just click a button and like everything's the results generated. While glycoproteomics and glyco- glycomics is like, um, it's still really developing and it's being rapidly developed at the moment. So um, in my opinion, but like, it's really, really complex compared to proteins where you only have like amino acids um, kind of like chaining together to form a polypeptide chain and then a 3D structures in proteins. While for glycans and glycoproteomics, you are dealing with like things that are, cannot be encoded by genetics on the genomes. And sometimes with the glycan structure, like sugar structures, you also have like the karate, the isomers that you need to deal like, with as well. So it's really hard to develop the self- software that kind of like distinguish and define define the fine structures in those area. So I think in a few years time, it but like a good thing is that like it's now being really developed and um, it's kind of like a it's not like only a country's a nation's effort, but like it's being developed worldwide from like Europe. I can see the effort from Europe and Japan, and like in our uni, um, Professor Nikki Packer. Um, it's also like a, a really good, a big, um, a, a big um, bridge connecting all the people from this field together. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, really like positive about the future of this area. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, Nikki is an absolute legend. Um, so, so Jade, I might come back to you now. Um, you mentioned that about 30% of people experience vestibular disease, which is massive. I had no idea it was that big. What I do know is that cats get vestibular disease, um, which is fascinating. And apparently it's quite common in cats, but they often recover quite quickly. And I remember there was a litter of tigers at Taronga um, and they were born with vestibular disease. And within weeks, they'd sort of adjusted to having balance challenges. 
I was just wondering, you know, whether you'd like to comment on, you know, the the prevalence of vestibular disease, the causes, and how, um, you know, the the sensors that you're developing may help not only humans but other species too. Yeah, uh, as I as I said, um, uh, um, f- um, one in three old people um, affect by the uh, balance disorders. Uh, this is because of the injury or the aging. And the main reason is uh, to lose the, the sensory health cells inside the semicircular canals or utricle and cycle. Um, in this project, we are, uh, we are trying to mimic the sensory health cells and 3D print the structure of the semicircular canals because the existing vestibular implants have some important challenges, important issues, like as I, as I said in the presentation, like um, um, damaging vestibular structure during the surgery or the important thing uh, when when we are trying to implant the vestibular implants in, inside the, the, the head, it uh, leads to uh, damage the hearing function, function actually, auditory function. So um, this, um, I know this research is in infancy, as in is so innovative actually to, um, to substitute the bio, bio-inspired vestibular system in, uh, into the vestibular system, the original, uh, original vestibular system, instead of implanting a bio-electronic device in, inside the head. So um, actually we are, uh, we are actually, uh, this work is a pioneering, pioneering work in this field and um, and we are trying to mimic the vestibular system instead of the uh, inserting the vestibular implants with so many challenges in it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm aware of time, so I'll just zip through. We've got a couple of questions coming through as well. But Harry, I was curious, you've said that your trial was the first in-man trial of the imaging technology. So what are the steps involved to get this technology into the clinics? What comes next? Um, well, in terms of, I mean, this is the first in-man trial of COPPER 67. Um, nuclear medicine departments all around the world um, do uh, radionuclide therapy and theranostic trials. Um, the interesting thing about this um, wasn't necessarily the COPPER 67, the therapeutic Um, agent. Uh, To me, the interesting thing was um, the diagnostic agent was copper 64 and the fact that copper 64 and copper 67 are chemically identical. So if you radio label one um, to some radio pharmaceutical, um, then you can radio label the other. So um, you can radio label the other to the same ligand. Um, So this was interesting um, in the sense that copper 64, the diagnostic imaging agent, has a long half-life. And so you can sort of um, do workup of therapy um, by imaging at multiple time points before you even deliver the therapy. Um, in terms of what's involved um, in a trial like this, um, it's hard to say. I mean, really, my research is focused on the radio labels. Um, but in terms of these trials, a lot of um, a lot of the work is in this sort of radiochemistry and the radio labeling. So, what drugs are you labeling these radioisotopes to? Um, so, yeah, I mean, like lutetium one seven seven therapy is um, sort of very common in terms of radionuclide therapy, um, but usually that diagnostic agent um, that they used. Uh, to work to demonstrate targeting is um, gallium 68, um, which has a short half-life. Um, 
so yeah, really the the sort of novel thing about this trial um, was the copper copper pairing and the fact that you had a long half life PET isotope and a long half life um, therapeutic isotope. Fantastic. So we mu- yeah, it does. It it may mean that we will see it in clinics sooner rather um, than later. But actually, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, the work that I presented and the work that I've been doing um, doesn't just apply to this trial. It really applies to any um, imaging or theranostic situation where you um, expect there to be um, a chorus, like a correspondence between the diagnostic image and the therapeutic image. So really, this is the first example of using um, PET images with superior resolution to guide the reconstruction of a SPECT therapeutic image. So um, a lot of the work I've been doing is um, has been um, gallium-68 and lutetium and um, sort of other theranostic pairs. So I haven't just done copper. I've done um, a few other sort of common theranostic pairs. That's fantastic. Thanks, Harry. We've got a question that's come through from Susan um, for Kevin. Um, She's asking, does aspirin, um, which is commonly used for its effects on platelets, act through the pathways you studied? And if so, how? Um, Yes. Um, Thank you, Susan. Um, Actually, aspirin does affect the platelet responses. And in fact, um, it may trigger the activations quickly or earlier as as um, um, as normal as per usual. So actually, during the experiments, um, I actually when when we isolated the blood, um, during the guideline, it said like the the donor needs to be like free from medications two weeks prior the drawing. So including the aspirin and the um, NZ as well. So that's why um. Uh, to short short the answers to shorten the answer yes aspirin does have um an effect on the um the platelet response in the body thanks kevin and we're running out of time so i'll just ask one last question of sajad from susan are there any equivalent to your model hair cells in nature and i know you've answered it in the chat but if you could just answer it for the audience that would be great yeah, as I mentioned in the uh, presentation, the copula inside the semicircle canal is a gelatinous structure with this, uh, is a gelatinous structure and in, in, in a standing shape. So we choose a rectangular shape for our sensor and the, the height of the sensor is, is in line with the height of the uh, ampulla. So this, um, this structure is uh, was inspired by the copula shape. Uh, in other hand, uh, this structure is very s- similar to the um, sensory hair cells in the skin of fishes in order to uh, detect the direction of the, the water, water flow and find the waves. Thanks, Sajad. And I I love all the animal references that we've had today. Um, I have heaps more questions, but we have run out of time and I know people are ready for their dinner. So thank you all um, for doing such wonderful presentations today. Congratulations on your awards. I hope you enjoy um, being part of the Royal Society and get actively engaged. Um, You know, we very much welcome you to our fold. And now I'd like to hand over to Judith Wielden, who's our Vice President, um, to deliver a vote of thanks. Over to you, Judith. Thank you, Kathy. And what a wonderful job it is to be able to thank the people who went into making this evening and making it the great success it is. The awards committee under the leadership of Phil Gale has done a very thorough and good job of choosing the uh, successful candidates in each of these categories. I'm sure you would agree with me. And when you know that there were many hard decisions to be made because of the quality of the candidature, then you will uh, really understand why we got such brilliant presentations tonight. And I'd like to also thank Stephen Weller and Kathy Beloff. 
uh, for listening so intently and asking such good questions to seek further information from each of our speakers this evening. You did a very good job. I enjoyed seeing the different styles of Stephen and Kathy, both very effective and both reflecting their own specialties and personality. A, a few words on each person individually, Zane. Uh, I thank you in particular for your very clear presentation of complex concepts and for making us feel that we are now a bit more up to date on one of these most, actually it's probably quantum uh, mechanics is not really more complex than the inner ear um, and the platelets and all the fine detail we're getting but it is the one that probably scares us the most in uh, wanting to understand and talk about it. You brought us up to date in some areas of that work and made us feel that we're on the cutting edge. So Zane, thank you very much. It was clear you. and easy to understand and I feel much better for having seen it. Sajan, you got me on my favorite topic right now. I've just been suffering from a very extreme case of vertigo, which won't go away. So I was fascinated to start with, but to not be personal about it, I found it really good to see so many other applications for your research as you go beyond your original goal and find other, other biological things that can be done but even going outside of our heads into um, other applications outside of medicine. Yeah. I also was fascinated to see how you started out as an engineer and just converted that to the inner ear, made perfectly good sense, uh, but a fascinating approach to it. Harry, I really enjoyed um, hearing about your approach to personal medicine, something that we all talk about and sounds like a great idea to everybody, but who understands it? Who understands how we know these things and how we work out something different for each person? I don't think any of us is qualified to carry on in that area, but it certainly is terrific to have a sense of not having just faith in personal medicine, but seeing where it comes from, how it works, and what you do in a particular case. So that uh, was a very valuable presentation as well. And Kevin, glycoproteomics, got a new word, uh, and a whole new area of seeing. If I remember correctly, when I was doing biology at university, over half a century ago, we just about knew that there were platelets and that was it. And who even knew that there was something to study and to do about platelets? Uh, and here you are talking about very fine detail of the platelets, what they do, how they work, what they're susceptible to. So fabulously interesting and encouraging to see how very, very far we've come in all of these fields. So I would like to congratulate you as well as thank you, each one of you individually. I hope you feel encouraged by the awards you've won, the scholarships you've won, and that you will make use of your year of uh, associate membership in the Royal Society to join us in activities, especially as we start to get back to face-to-face -to -face and can have the personal interaction, which makes all of this so much more valuable. So please be active participants and bring some of your fellow young scientists along with you. We really need to have our average age brought down quite dramatically. It's up to you, we can't do it. So to one last word, to these pioneering young scientists whom I thank very much 
for their work and the obvious work they've put in on their presentations to us. Thank you for another contribution, which is to give us a wonderful antidote in seeing your success in the work you're doing, a wonderful antidote to the terrible domestic and international news we're having to cope with. So another function of science is to take our minds off that stuff and show us there is a future, there is hope, there is possibility, and you're going to take us there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judith. And I'm going to take a nanosecond to close this meeting and wish everyone a good evening ahead and a good year. Thank you very much. Bye.